Hello and welcome to our webinar. Thank you for joining us. We come to you live from the Munich office where we are sat 1.5 meters apart from each other. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm Meg, I'm the content manager here at Zinscale um, and I work to produce blogs and webinars and videos and podcasts to engage with users like you. Arnold, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, so I'm a technical marketing specialist here and I come from a mechanical design background and I'm helping Meg and other people in marketing to produce uh, technical content that brings the value of SimScale in terms of accessibility and cap capabilities. So I come from, uh, as I said, a mechanical design background. So I've used extensively CAP and FEA tools to optimize the performance of uh, a lot of different uh, products. And of course, I've run a lot of different uh, project in the architecture architecture and engineering industry. So, um, and today we have a special guest uh, that is very relevant to our uh, to our topic, and that is Sebastian. Very kind. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, I'm Sebastian, I'm product manager here at SimScale, and specifically I'm responsible for our efforts around usability, making SimScale's interface easy and intuitive to use. Um, and accessible for everybody. Um, and I have a great team behind me that's helping me. Um, so I don't want to take any credit for this. And um, in front of you. And in front of me, <laughs> of the course. Um, exactly. Um, so this is kind of my role. Um, making SimScale the most accessible and easy to use tool um, in the scene. Do you want to tell us a little bit about SimScale? Of course. Um, so yeah, kind of eight years in the making. Um, essentially a bunch of very, very smart people and me um that is working on um or super passionate about the future of the CAE market um and um ready to take the, the simulation engineering um, um industry um and what we're doing is essentially um we're offering the first um production ready SaaS simulation platform so completely in the cloud completely accessible from your browser um if you want to run uh cfp and fba analysis or thermal simulation you can do this on SimScale. Um, the only thing you need is an internet connection and the browser and you're ready to go. Nothing to install. Um, and essentially, infinitely scalable. So if you want to run 100 simulations from your laptop, you can do it with us. What about 200? Even 200 should be possible. If you want to challenge us, we are up for the challenge. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and one main aspect of SimScale that I don't want to uh, miss out of is that we, we really want to be open, right? We really want to bring simulation to everybody out there, every engineer in the world who currently um, or so far couldn't access the simulation tool because it was too um, costly in terms of hardware or software um, or it was too difficult to use. He should be able to use or they should be able to use SimScale. Um, so we have over 200,000 users worldwide out there um, and uh, many more simulation projects that you can easily access um, online. Um, so please check it out. Okay. Um, so today we are going to talk about cloud-based collaboration and why this is important for engineers specifically. So the pressure to stay competitive for engineering teams has definitely increased. Um, they need to evolve their workflows and this doesn't mean just parts of it, the whole workflow. So this includes anything from the conceptual phase to early design phases and of course this includes the CAD phase and the simulation phase and that's where we come in. Um, but more on this, like engineering teams need to work beyond normal confines now. They need to work beyond siloing and um, physical locations and time zones. So this is also um, a factor involved. Um, how can engineers then use this to the, their advantage? And how can they kind of step onto this new playing field with their best foot forward? This is what we will talk about today. Um, so this playing field, I hope you're enjoying the visualizations, that the playing field or the hyper competitive landscape um, is very competitive as more and more engineering innovations are driven to the market. Um, we can see this like with statistics, obviously. So the mechanical engineering sector for one is like going to grow at an average annual rate of 3.8 over the next 10 years, which is quite a lot. Um, as well as just global engineering services um, are going to grow beyond 1.5 billion um, quite soon. So um, 
these are kind of examples that we can see through statistics, but like let's let's take it down a notch. Arno, how many engineered products do you think you deal with on a day to day basis? So from when you when you brush your teeth in the morning, if you brush your teeth in the morning, I hope you do, to <laughs> when you get the elevator down and take your bike or whatever to work. How many? Try to count now. Yeah, like so for example, like 50 or 100 a day tools or object you're you're using are essentially designed by companies, and these companies are essentially um, obliged to simulate or to anticipate the behavior of this of of this product under a specific condition, not only for health and safety but also for uh, functionality purposes. So imagine all the objects around you, they all have been somewhat tested, either numerically or with physical prototyping, but they have to be kind of in a way tested. And it's really interesting to evaluate the amount of things we use on a daily basis uh, that, that like you have necessity of, of simulating in a way or another. Mm -hmm. So this is then putting um, or piling, I guess, pressure onto engineering teams, yes. obviously, um, as more and more products are coming into the market. Um, so let's look more at this then. So engineering teams under pressure. So what are the main pressure points that they're feeling? So um, along with like having to produce more things, there's obviously shorter delivery times. And shorter delivery times, not only um, just the whole process has to be turned around quickly, also I think it's a bit more um, uh, challenging. We do have a customer example um, from David Akeret from Bruno Roshi, and we have a whole case study on this. So if you want to read more, hop over to our customer page where you can read all about it. Um, but also, okay, let's see who can get to the closest statistic, guys. So Salesforce came out with a report saying that this percentage of firms want their um, engineering firms or consultants that they're working with to implicitly know their needs and wants and dreams before they even tell them. What so how percentage? many want them to anticipate what they actually want? Mm -hmm. 100%. I don't, okay, that's a bit much. What do you think? Maybe 80? Mm, closer, 76%. So mm. that's already pretty, mm. pretty. Um, what else is, is an obstacle for engineering teams today? Globally dispersed teams, so working remotely and also far apart from each other. This is obviously um, a big thing that's happening right now, but also in general, I think it's becoming more and more commonplace. At SimScale, how many or what percentage do you think our workforce is remote? Let's say maybe 10% or a bit more, 15, I don't know. Okay, we have around 80 employees, so okay. Yeah. And probably right now more, right? Um, yeah, due to the circumstances, but mm -hmm. yeah, probably 20, 25, 30%. Just... 17 last time I calculated, okay. but we all know math is not my strong suit here. So, um, yeah, but this is definitely an issue. Um, more more stats like Forbes came out with an article in April where 50 percent, I guess, of the U.S. workforce are predicted now to be working from home. Um, yeah. So engineering teams under a lot of pressure, a lot of new challenges coming their way. Um, we do have more additional resources on kind of like from our perspective, how you can kind of overcome these from improving your design process and keeping remote workers engaged in the evolution of engineering teams. Um, but I think before we jump to what we should do in the future to kind of do this, we should first step back. So do you want to walk us through that? What is sure, that the sure, of course. Um, yeah, I guess to none of you here or to the audience, it would be a surprise if I tell you that as a company, as an organization, in order to stay competitive, you need to adapt new technology if it makes things um, more efficient. You need to constantly be back, right? Um, if you stand still, somebody else will overtake you. You cannot afford this. This is not news to anybody, right? Um, so there are some grooming examples out there, some um, uh, some big stories that you probably know where companies stay too comfortable in, the, in their position, where they essentially had a monopoly-like position and they missed the mark. Um, they didn't sense that there was something new out there that completely threatens their current um, business case. Um, examples like Blockbuster Video, for example, right? Um, they didn't they didn't catch the mark where they needed to go online, needed to go digital. Um, Netflix completely took over. Streaming is more convenient to people than um, ordering something um, via the phone or going to a store. Um, what was that other one too? Redbox? Mm -hmm. Do you remember Redbox? Yeah. Where you could do it. It was like Blockbuster, but like a vending machine. 
Yeah, okay. exactly. Just, just um, that's it. Netflix, easier, right? You don't need to go to a vending machine. You want to sit on your couch and click a button, and then you have okay. um, another example. Kodak, for example, actually inventing the first digital camera and then being too afraid that, hey, this would cannibalize our, our film market. Um, putting it in a drawer until somebody else um, had the same idea and completely obliterated their business, essentially, right? Kodak um, moment. Hmm? Kodak moment. Kodak moment, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you don't want to be one of these organizations. Um, Blackberry, another example, right? Um, putting a keyboard on a small device, right? Until a new technology came along that made it way more convenient, way more efficient to do the same thing and being very more flexible at the same time and look better also. Um, Apple took over, right? Um, you need to sense these, these points um, in time where you, as an organization, need to make a shift. And that's what we kind of want to talk about today, right? Um, what, what we believe is, what we strongly believe is that um, in the CAE market, we are still a top, bit behind. So you could see the same examples popping all over other industries already. And we are kind of catching up right now. That's what we are strongly believing right now, that this pivotal moment where you need to change the things that how you're doing them um, is right now. Um, and I think we have a good solution how we want to how we want to do it in the future. So we're happy to show you what we have done. But before we show that, I think we should take a step back and show other paradigm shifts, shall we? Oh no, do you want to sure. take it away? Yeah. So as uh, as said mentioned, there was um, a couple of um, in other industries there was a couple of shifts that happened and that companies uh, had to, uh, to to deal with. Uh, in the CAE world, and in this specific example of CAE and, and fluid dynamics, uh, we were, we're observing uh, two shifts. So the first one is already past us, and that is the one that is uh, concerning the uh, wind tunnel modeling. So uh, as you may know, uh, wind tunnel has started to be implemented uh, in the late 19th century, at the end of the first, uh, at the end of the um, industrial revolution, and engineers like the Wright brothers or uh, Gustave Eiffel, who directed the design of the Statue of Liberty or the Eiffel Tower, they've already started to implement wind tunnel testing on subscale model to understand how um, uh, surfaces and how object air force will behave under a certain uh, wind condition. And uh, even nowadays, despite these uh, these costs, the costs that are uh, implied with the physical testing. Uh, it's still necessary for uh, quality purposes, for standardization and validate uh, models. So, um, but gradually the uh, CFD came into play in the in the 70s and the 80s and gradually tried to complement this uh, wind tunnel analysis, uh, physical prototyping, and try to really um, Try to contribute in the way that there'll be less and less wind tunnel analysis, but we are not saying that it's completely uh, going to replace the physical prototyping, but uh, it tries to help and um, leverage the, the cost and the effort uh, associated with this. And uh, as a fact, I'm doing some research on this. Did you know that uh, uh, when doing physical uh, prototyping and working with wind tunnels, we can actually visualize the pressure on surfaces by using uh, pressure sensitive paint. And that will just color the surface uh, of the object the corresponding to the amount of pressure, very similarly to what we see in our CRD result with the pressure on awesome. and things like awesome. this. This so, is what they're using in, in Formula One? Yes. Right. Yeah. And so, they put paint on the car and then. Apparently, it's sensitive to oxygen and, uh, and okay. things like this. Also, it works for people. Possibly. Really pressure. Yeah. <laughs> could be, yeah, could be. So yeah, it's a very important uh, to, to highlight that, yeah, it will never fully re uh, replace the, C the CFD aspect, uh, at least in the next uh, 10, 10 to 20 years, where we still have some physical, at least uh, subscale model to be to be performed. Yeah. We talk about this quite a lot in our content. It's no, nowhere near close to replacing yet. It's just kind of something to be used additionally. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So companies have implemented this and this kind of two aspects uh, and try to yeah try to work with, with two and they they they've already kind of made that shift but now there's a second shift that is going to happen from the numerical modeling that is already implemented in companies on premises to the cloud. Exactly. So um, yeah, as I mentioned before, right um, from Vintel to the first numerical simulation tools emerging like probably 50 years ago. 
what's the first shift, right? If you look at the industry out there right now, any big automotive or aerospace company um, is using both, right? Mm -hmm. If they still would only use wind tunnels, they would not be competitive. So they needed to adapt. You needed to make this shift. Um, and we believe that we are right now at the second shift. Um, what we call a shift is kind of from premise to cloud. Right? Um, the idea that SimScape was founded on is um, making simulation accessible, easy to use, um, and affordable. Um, these are the three essential barriers that, mm, that kind of inhibit the traditional CE market to conquer the broader spectrum of companies right now. Um, if you look at the long tail of the market, the, the small to medium sized businesses, they cannot afford um, uh, adopting simulation tools in, in their everyday business, um, simply because of these three barriers. They don't have the money to buy the essential hardware. They don't have the money to buy the expensive licenses that come with it. Um, and because of that, they also don't have the know-how in-house to run these tools because they're usually pretty complex. Um, and, and this is kind of the, the essential basis that SimScale was founded on and that we want to overcome. Um, and the technology that allows us to do it, it's now out there. Um, let's start with cloud, right? Um, with the emergence of cloud in the early 2000s, um, you can now rent, buy, um, lease, um, whatever computational resources you require with a click of a button. Um, you don't need to buy anything in house. You don't need to have anything on premise. Um, and SimScale does it for you even. Um, so just imagine running one simulation on your computer. In the past, it kind of blocked your computer for a day or even multiple days or a week. Um, with SimScale, nothing runs on your local computer. Everything runs in the cloud and is completely scalable. You can run one simulation, a hundred simulations, a thousand simulations at the same time. What about a um, thousand and one? Yeah, also would work. But if you have to challenge us, we are up to take the challenge. Um, so this is number one, right? Um, no hardware, you don't need to buy anything. No upfront cost for you in terms of hardware. Um, the second inhibitor that was there before was pricing of the software. Um, usually large upfront costs, very inflexible pricing model. Um, speaking, depending on what you needed, but up to 100,000 uh, euros per license easily um, in some cases. Not a lot of companies could afford that. Um, ask a small, a small company, a small engineering and consultant firm out there, if they can afford such a license, they cannot. Um, what has emerged here is a very um, well-fitting pricing model for a cloud company, a cloud offering like ours with SaaS, software as a service. Salesforce was, um, um, was a first mover here. Um, mm -hmm. What it allows you is simply no upfront cost. Um, you lease it, you rent it on demand, um, a subscription-based pricing model month by month, um, um, I don't need to explain to anybody what the benefit is of not having any fixed costs, but variable costs only. Um, so SimScale is running on a SaaS model. Um, you can um, get our, um, our professional or team plans, um, our different plans on a, on a um, subscription-based pricing model. Um, good, and the third one um, is what we want to focus on right now today, um, which is the know-how. Right? Um, not having um, the ability to, to share your knowledge or to access the knowledge that you need was a huge inhibitor. Um, this is why SimScale was built on the premise that it should be as easy to use um, as possible. You, we are not assuming that you're a simulation engineer. Um, we are assuming that you're a designer, a scientist, an engineer um, who has very little exposure to simulation before. You should be able to use simulation. Um, and we um, do that by as I mentioned before, this is kind of my, my passion to make some scale the interface as easy to use as possible. Still a bit of a way to go there. Um, but um, also right now we um, we we know that the, the, the big the big change here is that we can allow you to collaborate. With the cloud, everybody is connected. And this is the problem of on-premise tools um, before. Um, they're not online, right? You are working in your own silo. Um, disconnected from your from the other people in your company that might have, might have the knowledge, or from us here at SimScale, uh, where we have a lot of simulation experts sitting in our support team. Um, by offering a cloud tool, everybody's connected by people already. And we just need to connect you, we need to give you the tools at hand in the interface um, to work together and share this knowledge. Um, so we believe we have now something at hand that really changes um, stuff dramatically. Um, uh, and yeah, we want to show you what we have done. Very good. Yeah. 
Um, so with this, so obviously um, CAE tools and moving to the cloud, everything's innovative. So where do engineering teams then have to evolve next in order to kind of keep up with this pace? Uh, and the answer is somewhere in between using cloud-based um, capabilities, CFD, and a new model of collaboration. So CAE predictions, what to expect? So not from our really perspective, this is research. You can read more about it in a blog that, um, that was, when was it published? Two weeks ago, I think, um, the evolution of CFD and uh, cloud computing. So this is predicted by other experts, I think mainly Nick McGuire, VP, head of AI research at CS Insights, that AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services are going to continue being the front runner for cloud services. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Um, next, you can probably expect a rise in popularity of collaboration-based cloud tools. So, I mean, that also is no surprise to anyone, especially now where everyone has to work remotely work and speak to each other and communicate with each other as efficiently and effectively as before. Um, next, I have an interesting quote there by Dr. Mark Halpern, one of the earliest pioneers of CAE. Pretty sure he was one of the first developers and mm -hmm. did, yeah. Um, the cloud essential to everything. He said this about five years ago. So obviously he knew his stuff and uh, he's right on, on the money there. Um, what else do you expect? Increasing CAD complexity. Also shouldn't be a no brainer as designs get more complex, but then you're going to need CAE tools to kind of go with this. Um, if you want more CAE predictions, we are releasing a podcast page today. Should be live very soon, if not already. Um, where we're talking to industry experts and customers about what they predict for CAE in the future, as well as what kind of they want to see in the future. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, but anyway, so CAD complexity, you're going to need more complex tools to go with this. So what does this mean for the future of CAE tools? So as Seb said earlier, you should no longer be <clears throat> sorry tied to hardware or chained to a desktop. This is very outdated at this point. Um, you need the flexibility and to be online to collaborate with colleagues and you know you do this anyway with um, your messaging and communication uh, platforms so it's no different really when you're looking at CAE tools. Um, no longer requiring sequential or siloed work, same concept, um, cloud enabled capabilities are probably going to be increasing. I know they're increasing for us so they will probably be increasing for other tools um, as well as collaboration features. And with this, um, Seb, do you kind of want to talk to us about how we at SimScale are enabling these cloud-based collaboration, uh, collaborations? Sure. Um, let, let's look at the at standard use case or, or how a lot of companies that, that I'm or we are talking to on a daily basis kind of tell us how they operate right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we will show you how we think it should be different in the future and what SimScale can do for you to, to change it. Um, so imagine I'm, I'm a designer or an engineer. I don't really have simulation background, which is actually true. Um, and I have a new iteration of my, of my model. Um, and right now I need help from our simulation department to help me out. Um, maybe I even have access to the tool, but I'm not really um, an expert in using it. So I'm struggling a bit. So I'm asking my simulation um, engineer in the other department, maybe sitting in a completely different continent, um, if he can help me out. And he will say, sure, I'll help you out. Um, but usually it takes like, you know, how, how it is in logical works. It takes two to three weeks until he has the time, then you go around the case. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, he will write a very nice report, uh, usually uh, export it as PDF, send it via email back to me. Um, I spot something that needs to be changed and we start over again. Um, these multiple weeks iteration cycles, they are not efficient. Um, totally understandable why it was, was done like this in the past, but there was just no alternative. Um, but they, we think there's a better way out there. Um, and this is what we kind of want to show you. We want to show you that SimScale is so easy to use that you as a non-simulation expert can use it. And then we want to show you how the collaboration features that we shipped recently on top can help you to get the knowledge that you need on your project quickly from somebody else who might be not in the same location, not immediately available to you. Exactly. So that's, uh, um, that's where I'm going to uh, show you a typical workflow and how the collaboration feature will help uh, engineers to collaborate between each other and, and work on the same project. 
So as you may or may not know, um, simulation within the SimScale platform work, uh, work like this. So you first start by importing your, the geometry in terms of a 3D model that represents your design. So it is either a pump or an HVAC simulation. So you have a room with different inlets, outlets. You can have uh, also a structure for solid mechanics. So you import this on the SimScale platform to the brother. And you can then select the type of simulation you want to, uh, to simulate. So uh, select the type of simulation, and then the tree pops up. And you can follow uh, with a step-by-step -step procedure with some kind of traffic light indicators that will inform you if you have some information missing in order to, for you to run uh, your simulation. The nice thing is that you can run multiple simulations design, like, like, like we said, and in parallel. So I can simulate different design at the same time, or I can simulate the same design, but under different uh, operating conditions. And I can compare them side to side and see uh, which one performs best. And if there are issues in the design, there are issues with the flow. And uh, this allows me, as a designer, to make a better design decision. Um, in that specific environment, I can now, with this collaboration feature, ask my colleague to intervene on the same project, giving their input, changing some parameters, and, 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 and collaborate on the, same, on the same project. So this is what we're going to demonstrate now to you. Mm -hmm. Good. So what we want to show you now is essentially how the new collaboration mode works uh, in some scale of that example. Um, what you see here is now, it's a project I did, um, or I'm trying to do. Um, full disclosure, I'm a big Formula One fan. Um, I thought I can use SimScale to see the slipstream behavior of streetcars following each other. It's one of the big challenges right now, um, but besides the point. Um, but again, I, I'm not a simulation expert as I said before, right? I really have no clue what I'm doing. Um, I have enough exposure to SimScale already to know, okay, the basics of the setup, mm -hmm. but I'm really not confident that what I did is the correct thing, right? But I know that Anno is. Anno is uh, one of the best simulation experts that I know. And um, he's not sitting right now, he's sitting next to me, but usually he, he is sitting in, in different different places. And I'm, I'm asking him for help right now. Um, so far, I always had to copy back and forth. Um, in the end, we had three different instances of the same project, everything getting out of sync. Um, right now, what I can do, I can give him live access, live edit access to my project that I'm working on right now in real time. And I'm asking him to take over right now. So I'm having a look now, as you can see, into Sebastian's project. I can request uh, to edit his project, and I, I can, and he's going on his side to allow me to, uh, to edit it. So I cannot just simply jump in and change everything. He needs to allow it beforehand. Uh, now that I'm in, I see that a, little, a small logo showing that Sebastian is the owner of the project, but I can change some parameters. So this is, uh, for example, me changing uh, the velocity of the car, so I'm changing the velocity of the air, the velocity of the, of the uh, ground, and I'll be uh, step by step changing a couple of parameters. And this, this is, for example, the rotation of the wheels that I'm going to change, obviously, because we are uh, changing the overall speed of the cars. So you see that I can easily interact with this project. He's going to be able to see these changes. And uh, he's also going to be able to, uh, to work on other projects at the same time. And this is what is nice, is that you can really do all the things at the same time. Uh, I can start a new run. So I say that I name it my way. And with the parameters I have changed, and I can click Start. And Sebastian on his side is going to be able to see it. Uh, I can, and now Sebastian is taking over. And uh, he's now the editor of, of his own project. Exactly. This is great, right? I can do the start. I can I can do all the basics, what I'm confident with, and in the end, just give it over to you. You check out what I did. You change the stuff that I did wrong. Um, make some basic adjustments. Um, no copying back and forth. Um, no time delay. Um, I see it live. Um, you take it over. We obviously do it sequentially, so um, mm -hmm. the changes, you always have full control over the changes when you're in editing mode. Um, this is great. I, I don't have to wait three weeks um, yeah. to get back. Uh, and the, and the, the great thing here is that not only we as a team can collaborate, but even if you don't have the simulation expert knowledge in house in your organization, what you can do is simply you can um, let the SimScale support jump into your project. Um, you simply click a button. Um, we have essentially 24 7 support. Um, so 
if you're struggling with the own simulation project, you're not a simulation expert, but you would like to use a tool like this, um, simply share with the port. They will jump in, they will make the adjustments, they will help you with your setup, um, and you're ready to go in a few minutes. Um, and this is the power of this collaboration tool. Um, I simply love it. Uh, it's awesome. I use it as much as possible. Um, and yeah, uh, I think support um, uh, is very fond of it. Um, but this is not the only thing that uh, that SimScan allows you to do, right? Um, the, the sharing tool, as we just showed, is available in our, our team plans. Um, so check this one out. Um, but even if you are, um, if you want to just check out SimScan for free, um, this, again, as I said before, right, this is what SimScan was wanted on. We want to make it accessible to everybody, every engineer in the world. Um, we have a free community plan. Bit of a limited feature set, but still very powerful. Um, so you can use SimScale and simulation SimScale tools for free. Um, and if you sign up, you would be joining a large community of right now, I think over 200,000 mm. engineers already um, out there. Um, and not only that, everything that you do in the community plan is public. And that allows you to not only um, talk to other engineers, but also to um, search in the library that we have, the public simulation projects library, or a project that's kind of just like yours. Copy it over, change it to your own design, and you're ready to go. You don't need to know anything about your setup. Um, you just set it up, copy it, um, and click start. That's, um, that's super straightforward. Um, and kind of use it as a simulation template. But also, as I said before, that's kind of my my, uh, my passion. Also, the interface should be fairly intuitive, hopefully. Um, um, but, but please reach out to me if you, if you think differently. Um, and if you want to become uh, more knowledgeable in terms of simulation, um, then also check out our documentation. There's a lot of tutorials there, step by step guides, how to set up a simulation, teaching you a lot of also the background um, of simulation, our SimWiki. Um, so, a lot of information out there for you to, to really get up to speed with simulation. Yeah, and YouTube videos on our YouTube channel, yep. of course. Um, cool. Well, I think at that point, um, that actually brings us to the end of our content for today. But at this point, we will take questions. So let's see what kind of questions we have. Any questions in general about SimScale? Any question about these specific features? Uh, I think uh, yeah, we can take advantage of mm. uh, me being here, Sebastian, who is mostly responsible for the uh, development of this specific mm. feature. Uh, take his knowledge here. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm on my own point, I'm also happy to give an outlook of what we want to do next, right? Mm -hmm. um, because the feature we just showed is, is our first step um, mm -hmm. in our larger collaboration initiative that we want to try right now. So carrying back and forth is, is one big advantage, right? It's the first step. But in the future, we also are thinking about letting you make notes in your project um, um, or having a change history to see who changed what, for example. Um, nice. So if you have any ideas of what you should do next, in your opinion, please reach out to us ask a question and I'm happy to share with you if you have it on our robot and if so mm -hmm. um, how far it's out. Mm -hmm. Yeah I mean on top of that as I, as I say in, uh, in most of our webinars uh, yeah don't hesitate to bring suggestions bring comments and mm -hmm. we collect everything all everything you say uh, into into our, our internal system and this kind of you know voted way drives us to develop new features. This, for example, is something, this collaboration feature was something we had in mind for a long time, but it was confirmed by a lot of different customers we have, a lot of, the, a lot of different suggestions we received to implement this feature. So you please feel free to, to add your suggestions about any kind of features you want to have on the platform. We have one question. Is our data secure on the cloud? Good question. <laughs> We definitely do have content on this written by our backend team. Yes. So if you want to check out some blogs written by Mr. Anatole Dammer, there yes. he'll probably answer way better than us. So what we will tell you essentially is that if you believe that you can do a better job in securing your on-premise um, systems, mm -hmm. then we and Amazon together, who we are using as our cloud provider, then uh, head um, head off to you. Or well, how do you say in English? Yeah. Um, That's off. To it you. Is, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, we believe cloud and uh, and SimScale is probably the most secure way that you can go. We have another question: Is real-time simulation possible? I mean, 
there um, are some technologies out there that so if by real time you mean uh something that's dependent on uh, something that is not steady state but more uh, transient way yes we can do this in in with two different solver one is uh the, the main one that we use for convective transfer for compressible and really doing sequential sequentially um one time state at a time this is very computationally expensive you can do it but what we are moving towards to now is um, a new solver, which is called Lattice Boltzmann uh, method, which is brought to us through SimScale by a company called Numerica. And um, this uh, is what we call the PayStage solver. And this uh, allows you to run simulation in a transient way. So you can really visualize particles as they develop, visualize vortices. As they as they get created and and disappear and all these kind of transient phenomena you can see them very easily and this new method is very efficient in terms of uh, computational effort and really gives you fast accurate and most of all robust results as well so it's totally possible with this system it's numeric systems numeric yeah mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question. I quite like this question, but I think I think someone else should answer it. That's an engineer. Um, what is the difference between a normal CAE software and SimScale? You are should I? Yeah, I think you should. I should. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, I guess what you're referring to with the word normal is standard tool like ANSYS, SolidWorks, mm -hmm. CFD, and so on. Um, I mean, a big difference simply is that those softwares if you're not using a cloud hosting provider and some tools out there, is that they're running on-premise, right? You're running it on your local hardware, um, using your local CPU um, or GPU if you're totally fancy. Um, and as soon as you click start, you are you will notice some performance um, um, issues with your computer. You're not usually able to use it for anything else, and it will take a lot of time to to complete, right? Um, what Simsco is doing differently, it's taking this technology, um, those solvers, and putting it completely in the cloud. Uh, you don't need to install anything. You simply open your browser, mm. go to simscale.com, log in, you have an interface in your browser without installing anything. You set up your simulation, you click start, and nothing runs locally. Everything runs in the cloud. And if you need a 96 core machine with a ton of RAM, then we will start it up in the background um, and do it for you. And you can do this, uh, as I said before, um, not only once at a time, but then you can run 10 of those at the same time or 100 or 1,000 if you need to. Mm -hmm. I think also price comes into play here. Yes, I mean, yeah, you need a big computer to do this locally. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, again, again, with the scale, there is no installation, there is no resources that are locally taken uh, by, by the computation. That's, that's very important to highlight again. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think at this point we should wrap up, um, but we will answer any remaining questions as well as send all of the resources we've kind of talked about today by email to all of our registrants. So don't worry, you will get all of this as well, like that you can read through yourself. Um, but thank you so much for joining today. It's been really fun. Don't you think, guys? Yes, well, thanks for having me. It's like having a conversation, you know? We are on our silver. Well, and it literally is like we're having a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we are. All right. Yes. Well, nice session, guys. Cool. Thanks so See much. Thank you, guys. Bye. See you next time.